Thank you. I'm more of a kid than anything. I can't even like talk without being on my little toy. Uh, I do bring these one wheels everywhere with me around the world. Uh, and I go and speak at all these conferences and then I'm always rolling around the one wheel. People are like, is that a gimmick? I'm like, no, it just makes me happy. <laughs> and I'm a funner speaker when I'm happy. So I'm gonna tell you a story. I'm 42 years old today. 22 years ago, I was a carpenter. I built home, that's what I did. I took nails and a hammer, and I put nails in wood, put things together, and we built homes for people to live in. Every once in a while, I'd work on a commercial project, like, you know, big restaurants and hotels, things like that. So my favorite place where I live, I live in Santa Cruz. Favorite place where I live is a place called Capitola Village. And so if you've ever been there, there's the wharf there, which got totally destroyed in January. And there is, uh, you know, all these great restaurants and places. And so three restaurants and a coffee shop and a few apartments were just wrecked with the weather 25 years ago. So we take on this project and I'm building this, this place. And I remember hanging my legs over the water because this place is like on the sand, on the water, looking at the wharf. And I remember hanging my legs and thinking, somebody's gonna live here. I can't believe somebody's gonna live in this place. And uh, I just moved into that place recently. Now, I didn't move into the place because I'm like wealthy and I can afford it and I finally bought my dream home. It just happened to work out that way uh, that the place became available. But I think it's interesting how oftentimes when we're young, we have all this vision, all these ideas of what could be, like what we could do, like what's possible. And then as people get older, you see this in your uncles and your aunts and your grandparents, they kind of get disheartened. You know, they stop being fun. They stop being like a kid. They stop riding around on stupid little toys and, you know, just being lighthearted about things and everything becomes so serious all the time. And if I was serious, then I probably would have just got like a government job or I just would have like been a sales guy because I'm pretty good at talking at like one company and I just would have been like focused on, I don't know, just accumulating a lot of things and that hasn't been my story. I, I've co-founded eight companies, which is like every single time I start a company, it's like I won't signing up for a death march to a life camp again. That's, that's what an entrepreneur does. It's a death march. And very rarely does anybody actually make it to the life camp, like the exit, the sale, the seven-figure salary. I mean, the likelihood of getting to that end result is so, so very low. And what usually happens is it falters, it fails, it falls apart in some way, or if you get kicked out. If you're the founder, oftentimes people are like, you start to have a real business with real payroll and legal issues, and they're like, this guy, this guy's crazy. He is, we don't want him around anymore. And you see this with people like Steve Jobs being kicked out of uh, companies. You can kind of see this across the board. And so that's been an interesting choice is for me to go through the process of starting companies with my friends. I've never started anything alone. I've always had a couple of people with me and I've actually had the same team with me for a decade. So two folks have been with me for 16 years, one 13, one 10. And uh, it's nice to be able to kind of start things over and over again with the same team. So it's a little background. I, I'm a father, I'm a dad. I have two boys, 10 and 14. We have this beach house, which is amazing. I kind of started with that story of having this vision of what could be, could I, what would it be like to live in a place like this that I built, right? That I sweat in, that I bled over, you know what I mean? And now being able to live there and kind of see like this idea manifest. We also live in a tree house. So you have a tree house in the forest about a mile from the beach and it's a tree I used to build forts on when I was a kid. And again, I don't have this tree house because I'm like, I made it in life and now I went to go buy the tree. It just, that was a tree I grew up on the property. And now we finally just threw a tree house together. It's this very cool tree house that we've kind of live in. Uh, and so I live a bit of a different life in that I have like the craziest, busiest place to live at the beach at Capitola Village. And then I have like the most peaceful away from anybody place to live. And so I can kind of go back and forth in my extroverted and introverted modes, depending on kind of what's jamming for me and my children. Um, I do travel a lot. I'm flying to Istanbul, Turkey in a few hours. And uh, then I'll go over to Latvia and I'll meet with uh, parliament there in Latvia. I just came back from Singapore, Manila, and London in the last two weeks. And I don't really enjoy traveling. When I was in my 20s, I traveled around the world 
doing music stuff and I was like, I'm tapped out. I don't want to travel anymore. I'm done with planes and hotels. Kind of took all travel off in my 30s, uh, but I'm back to travel mode. Uh, a lot of it's because I co-produce these events. So I co-produce a ton of AI and blockchain events. Um, so if you are in the AI space, maybe you've heard of Voice and AI or Project Voice or CES. I coordinate a lot of the uh, AI content over at CES in Las Vegas. If you're in the blockchain world, maybe you've heard of events like Consensus or NFT NYC. I helped launch NFT NYC. We had 16,000 people at that event in New York uh, last year. So I travel around now because I enjoy jumping on the one wheel and talking about the yin and the yang of things. This is how people glorify stuff. And this is how people demonize things and trying to like draw people to a balanced perspective. This is probably what it's really like, right? It's not like Democrats, Republicans are evil and this party's good. It's not, this is the only good religion and everything else is bad, right? This is the only way to do business in all of other ways. That's not really accurate. So I like my board because I get to go. It's just really an excuse to have fun. Like I'm just basically looking for a chance to just smile and feel joyful and this works for me. So I thought I'd spend most of my time just doing Q&A. Uh, I used to bring a soft Frisbee and if people didn't ask me questions, I'd throw the Frisbee at people. And whoever it hit, they had to ask me a question. I forgot my Frisbee. <laughs> so you're gonna have to just be uh, courageous and ask me a question. If you have any questions about entrepreneurship, about international business, about team building, about restraining yourself. It's probably something I've learned more than anything. You know, not being so quick to say everything on my mind, not telling people about what will be one day as though it is today, and then setting people up for expectations I never had to set in the first place. Uh, you might have questions about the AI industry, right? I know the founders of Apple Siri, Samsung Bixby, Amazon Alexa, uh, Microsoft Cortana, I know a lot of the team at OpenAI that created ChatGPT. You might have questions about blockchain. I know many of the founders that started Ethereum and Hedera and many of the other blockchains that kind of run this distributed ledger network. So you may have specific questions about industry or just international business, the stuff that you're all talking about in this class. And so I'll just take some questions for a while. And then if it gets boring, I'll tell some stories. Yeah, does that sound good? Anybody want to ask a question? And what's your name, please? Ian. Your name's Ian. Yes, what a name. What a name. I mean, it's short, just three letters. It's easy to remember. There was a hurricane. We did a lot of damage recently. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> it's, it used to be rare. It's more popular. I have two Ians, other Ians at my company. It's really weird. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so there's two founders. There's three founders of Apple Siri. Steve Jobs basically, you know, it was as close to like begging them to sell Siri to Apple. It was a very strange acquisition. Of the three founders, two went and started uh, Samsung Bixby. And it was called Viv Labs. And, they, and here's what's happened for these guys. They have this idea of what Jarvis could be, like we see in Iron Man. And then they bring it to a big company like Apple. And then Apple ruins it. So then they go, that's not what I wanted. That sucks, man. Everybody's pissed off at my invention. It was so much better when it was started. Now it just gets worse and worse every single update. That's it. I'm starting again. So then they start Viv Labs, and then Samsung buys it. And they think, okay, this is it. We know how to structure the deal so that Samsung doesn't ruin our voice assistant. But they did. No. <laughs> I know. I know. They know that, too. It's very disappointing. <laughs> yeah. Any other Questions? Yeah, what's your name? Hi, Annie. I'm Ian. I am. I get denied at the airport from time to time, which is very tricky. Very tricky when I can't persuade. I've tried a lot of things. Rock, paper, scissors has worked for me before, believe it or not, and, which was surprising to do rock, paper, scissors with the TSA guy. And uh, they, he didn't think it was very funny. I thought it was hilarious. And I just basically pestered him until he gave in after beating him at rock, paper, scissors multiple times. <laughs> uh, no, I, actually, I couldn't bring it to Manila. So I bought one when I arrived. Uh, There's like five one wheels in the whole entire country of Philippines. And I begged some guy to sell me his one wheel. Uh, mission accomplished. I did 30 miles on a one wheel 
inside of the Marriott Hotel in one week. It's wild. 150,000 feet. It was basically like I was sprinting everywhere. It's like I just sprint at 15 miles an hour and I hang out with my friends and I sprint over there and then I go talk. It was fun. And did you have another question besides if I am bringing this to Istanbul, which I am? Um, Unless I get denied. I'll, I'll ask a question in Italian. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hi, what's your name? Mara. Hi, Mara. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, could you tell us about some of your components you've co founded and founded? Sure. So the company I've spent the last six years on is called Attention Live. So A-T-T-N dot L-I-V-E. Um, it's probably worth taking a look at that website because I think we've done something different with how we present ourselves. Uh, A-T-T-N dot L-I-V-E. You'll see um, kind of a quick little short talk where I'm kind of casting the vision and then you'll see me and my chief of ethics on the couch talking about what we've actually built. So we built our minimal viable product, kind of like the first idea in 2020. We built version one in 2021, totally failed. Like nobody wanted to use it, it was too hard to figure out. Redid it in 2022, I failed again. <laughs> and now we have version three, or as my tech team likes to call it, version 0 0.3. They say, Ian, don't call it version three. We haven't even accomplished the goal of onboarding people. Uh, so version 0 0.3 is done. And what this product does, is it's a software like you'd use it on any phone or tablet. And what it does is it allows you to basically do live content creation or upload content. And then we mint one or multiple tokens for you against that content so that you prove that you own it, you can sell it, you can license, you can license it, all automated. And we also distribute that content to different social media sites like YouTube. And we have an open AI integration so that you can create uh, text to image inside of our system with Dolly, and it's quite advanced. We invented three different things. We got our patent finally approved. We have patent in 35 countries uh, that's in process. And one day, Attention Live is going to be an overnight success. And they're going to be like, how did you guys do it? How did you go from nobody knows who you are to the biggest content creation platform? We think that we're the Gutenberg printing press of the digital age. Time will tell. Um, another company I started is called Kukui, K-U-K-U-I dot com. Uh, we named it Kukui because of the Hawaiian tree. Uh, that's the Hawaiian tree. It's like the nation, the uh, national tree, I guess you'd call it. The people put lays of flowers, but also lays of those nuts. That's a Kukui nut. And when you crack them, they glow in the dark. And we thought that was a cool thing. So we called our company Kukui. We built a software platform. We charged people like $2,500 a month. 30 grand a year. And I started that here in San Francisco, basically. And I would walk in, <laughs> I'd walk in with an iPad into auto repair shops. And I'm like, I got good news. And these guys are like, oh no, oh no. How do I get this guy to leave my shop? I don't even want to, I don't want to hear another word, you know? And I could feel the energy, like, he doesn't want me here. He doesn't want to hear my good news. <laughs> I got good news. I got good news. Hold on, let me just tell you what the good news is. Do you use these? And I'd ask, do you use this, 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 this? Yeah, I hate those companies. I hate that stuff. I'm like, me too. I hate it too. Well, we built a software that does all that in one place. And they're like, nah, you're, you're lying. And I was kind of exaggerating, to be honest with you. It wasn't quite done. <laughs> yeah, it was an idea. It was an idea. And I basically said, okay, you give me money and six months and I'm going to build this bad boy for you. And so it worked. Anyway, it ended up scaling to thousands of customers. We were able to reduce the price from $2,500 a month down to like three dollars to $500 a month. And it was a wildly successful company. We ran auto repair shops, all their marketing, all their operations, all their finance, uh, recorded all their calls, did all their postcards, their emails, their text message, all their social media, all their Google AdWords. Every time somebody went on the website, the website changed. So somebody typed in like, Audi oil change, or Volkswagen tires, or you know Ford engine. The whole entire website for each of our customers would completely dynamically change. Super, super fun company. That was the, probably the most successful company because we had a private equity firm acquire that company. Um, I've started some agencies when I don't know what to do. I'm not really sure. I just like we'll start an agency because I have all these friends, and so I'll start doing work for. MLB, NFL, Nike, Absolute, a bunch of charities. I work with a lot of global nonprofits, and I'll basically, like, I don't know what really to do right now, or the idea I have is too hard, so I'm just going to, like, start an agency to make some money. I haven't really raised money up to this point in my career. I've been able to, like, just get clients to give me their money 
for our products and our services. That seemed to make sense to me. When all the crazy investment stuff has happened in the Silicon Valley the last 20 years, I thought it was kind of weird. That was kind of weird to tell people, give me your money and we'll be successful and we'll give you three times or 10 times as much money back one day. That seemed like kind of a strange thing to promise people. Even if it wasn't a promise, that's basically what they expect of you. So we were able to, to have successful companies or failed. I failed in a lot of companies too. Um, I'll give you an example of two fun companies that I helped start, but weren't, I don't really consider myself the co-founder. Like, I'm a co-founder if I actually started it. It was my idea. We paid taxes. We had employees. Like, it was a legit company. I've like, helped start a lot of things. Uh, two that were fun is the competitor to One Wheel. So One Wheel, got Kyle out of Santa Cruz came out with One Wheel. When this product came out, I thought this was the worst product in the world. I mean, I was like, that thing is ugly. It got a wheelbarrow wheel on it. It feels, looks like it's made out of cardboard. Like, who wants to ride that? What a lame product is what I would think, because I was competitive. I, I liked my product better. So this was $1,500 when they brought it to market. Super safe to ride. Our product was called the GeoBlade. We owned Hoverboard.com. We owned the Hoverboard trademark. And we launched our product on Kickstarter on October 21st, 2015, the same day as is in Back to the Future 2. And we had all this publicity. We're on the Kathy Lee Regis show, I think it was, maybe it was Michael Strahan back then. I don't really remember. We got every major news publication to write about us. And our product was 10 grand. And it had lights all around it, had two removable batteries, had four speakers on it. It went like, the best one wheel made today, still, it would charge faster, go further. It was a faster product. So it was just way advanced and the market didn't want it and it was dangerous. We had a really thin wheel. So all of us on the team got hurt. <laughs> and after like six months, the inventor said, I'm done. We're not doing it anymore. I'm over it. We're killing the company. Let Kyle at One Wheel have the market. And I think Kyle's selling like 25,000 boards a month right now and has been for years at one to $2,000 a pop. So pretty amazing. So that'd be an example of like a company I helped launch where we had a great idea, had a superior, a superior product, superior in terms of what we thought was better. Uh, it was too expensive. Their product was inferior in our mind, but ultimately it was safe and they've been able to scale. And Kyle's done a great job with that. Another product would be if you've seen the pop socket that you put on the back of your phone. So we created this thing called the hand snap and it like attached your phone to your hand. So our product we sold for $50, cost us like $20 to make. It was super amazing. And the pop socket cost 18 cents to make, and they sold for $10. So pop socket crushed us. <laughs> and so I, I knew that one day everybody's gonna wanna have something like to attach their phone to their hand. Like, you know, everybody's dropping their phone. They got, gotta have, fix the problem. And they just fixed the problem much better. So hand snap was not successful. We recruited the president of pop socket to join us. We changed the entire company. And now that company hand snap is called the snap clip. It's a one click button and that button controls your phone. And we have that in every Best Buy in the nation and we sold tens of thousands of them. So that's a story of like things failing and then trying to find your way until you finally get to success. I've started a bunch of other things. Um, I'm trying to think like what's brought me the most joy. Of all the things I've started, what's brought me the most joy? I don't know, I did a commune at my house when I was in my 20s, that was pretty rad. So that's how I started traveling around the world. I think maybe that was pretty incredible. I was your age. Most of you look like you're in your 20s. And I had 30 people live at my house. We were not, we were like, <clears throat> it wasn't like a calming like you're thinking. It was like a mission. We were hardcore. We were intense humans. <laughs> uh, we were about a big mission. And so we did 200 concerts around the world through Asia, Europe, and the States. We did five albums. We distributed 135,000 free CDs. We'd write music for nonprofit organizations. So we had the most well-known song in the world for human trafficking called Beautiful Slave. Wrote a song called Wintry Soul about depression. Wrote a song called My Will Spins about drug addiction. All these super sad songs <laughs> about human conditions that were just uh, difficult for people to deal with. So we'd write these songs. We called our band Take No Glory. And we basically, I'd call all these different nonprofits around the world and I'd be like, hey, we wrote this song for you. You can take it. Doesn't matter who we are. Don't tell anybody about us. Just use this for advocacy and fundraising. So that was a pretty rad experience because I did that for like three years. And it was just like, if you ever seen the movie Moneyball with Brad Pitt, 
he talks about how romantic baseball is. Like that was the most romantic thing I'd ever started. Like everything about it was just like a fantasy. And, you know, we're just gonna give all our music away for free. We're gonna do all our concerts for free. You know, we call ourselves musicianaries. We were on this mission, you know, it was pretty wild. Uh, so that was a fun business, but I don't know if I remember the rest. I'll go to you next, Annie, but go ahead, because I already taken a question, go ahead. What's your name? Ifon. Ifon, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I want to ask, where do you get the financials to start off with something as big as this? Like? Okay, so that's a lot of questions in one. So how do I travel around the world? Uh, in the case of this month, I am part of a company called Hedera. Hedera is the fastest, least expensive, uh, least pollution, most decentralized distributed ledger in the world. Hedera is the blockchain that was built for the enterprise by the enterprise, Google, IBM, LG, Boeing, and 25 other companies. So I help lead their executive team, uh, in addition to all the other things that I do. And they asked me to travel around the world this month to go and speak at a bunch of conferences where we're sponsored. And so, and I'm trying to do different, create new opportunities for us across Asia and Europe. So that's this month. So the reason why I went to London and Manila and Singapore, I'm going to Istanbul today and then going to Latvia is all for Hedera. So Hedera is paying for my traveling. Um, in the past, when I need to go somewhere, I usually will get whatever startup I'm representing that is my company to pay for it. And then we get the money by charging our clients for our products and services. I haven't paid for my own travel for a long time. Um, I am pretty easy going, so I don't have to travel business class. I mean, uh, if a company will pay for it, I'm glad to take it, you know? Who doesn't want to lay down on a plane? Uh, I don't have to stay in the nicest hotels, and if I decide I want to, then I'll make that happen. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm easy sleeping in a car, and, and, you know, like, I'm pretty adaptable. So I don't really want to travel. That makes it way easier for me. I think if I, like, had this travel bug, then I would like force it to happen. I'd probably end up go going through a lot of cost. So that's travel. Yes, but how do I start these companies? So um, I'm persuasive, as you might imagine, through my ability to talk to you on a one wheel. And I basically tell my friends, I got this big vision. Okay, you know the three billion people in the world that make $2 a day? You know the three billion people in the world that don't have the internet yet? This is the problem they have, and this is the solution we're gonna create. Let's do this together. And then I just get enough people to be like, you might be right, we'll do it. Um, so I basically get a bunch of people to volunteer <laughs> to join me for these crazy adventures. And if we ever actually get a real tangible money-making company, then they were there first, and so they have equity and they have uh, salaries and they have bonuses, but basically I get a, a small group of people to take massive risk with me. So I don't pay myself, I don't pay them, and we all, and we all work other jobs. And basically it's the bootstrap model. And so I don't capitalize my companies. Now, in the case of Attention Live, it's been six years. So I did have to invest a tremendous amount of my own money into that company. Uh, I had to hustle really hard to get client contracts so that we could kind of cover the expenses of development. Uh, but in tradition, I just take a product or a service, I go to prospective customers, and I ask them to give me their money, and then I will give them this service and or I will give them this product, and that is how I capitalize companies, is the way that our great-great-grandparents have always done it, the way that humans have done it for millennia. The new way of asking wealthy people for their money with the expectation of giving them three, seven, 25x return is a totally new model. And if you really do the math, it's very strange and it's never been super attractive to me. Does that answer your question, Annie? Oh, I love that question. What a great question. I'm trying to think if I can think of anybody, any organization in the world that I honor more than Hedera. Just give me a second. Let me think about it. Hmm. I 
I'm, I, I'm just going to stick with Hedera. So, I mean, I know it best, and there's a reason why I went there. I know the founders, Manson Lehman, and my friend Brett is the chairman, and so they invited me to come and be part of their executive team and for a short period of time. And Hedera is the company that I'm most dependent on for my company, Attention Live. For Attention Live, our content creation tool, to scale to billions of users, Hedera has to actually be what I think it is. So I said, yes, I'd go there. So here's why I think Hedera is the ultimate business model. They are the most decentralized uh, infrastructure I've ever seen. So what that means is that with Hedera, there's not one person or team that makes all the decisions. There's not one company that makes all the decisions. Hedera is 29 council members. So that's, I mentioned Google, IBM, Boeing, and LG, and others. They all have come together to say we need to build an enterprise, you know, Fortune 500 level blockchain, distributed ledger network, for us, so that we can use this for all the boring things that, you know, basically distributed ledger could help with. So they committed to running our nodes, which is why it's so inexpensive, and why it's so fast, and why the uh, environmental impact is the least of any blockchain in the world. So we have the 29 council members, we then have six committees, and we have a board. So the board makes certain decisions, the council makes certain decisions, and each of the six committees makes certain decisions. There's two chairs for each committee that rotate out, the board rotates out, and then we have five companies. So the company I'm at is Hedera Hashgraph LLC, and I have the CFO and, and the finance team and the uh, general counsel and the legal team. We have our uh, you know, chief policy officer working to change policy globally, the chief regulation officer looking at uh, regulation, compliance, and risk. We have our chief open source officer trying to get the whole entire developer community excited about it, and we have my operations team. And so that's the little tight team that kind of does what the board tells us to do. And then we have a company called Swirls Labs with the founders and they maintain and improve our technology and do all of our marketing. And then we have three foundations. So the foundations are all a little bit different, but just think one is for education. They kind of just focus on education opportunities. Uh, and then one is like for startups and enterprises. And one is for like enterprises and government contracts. We basically will give a government like $1.5 million and say, here's money to build with our technology. We'll give a startup like a quarter million dollars and an enterprise $750,000. That's just one of our foundations. So basically, we give uh, organizations money so that they can hire developers to build on our platform. So the reason why I think Hedera is the best model is that if any one of the companies failed, the network still runs. If any of the 29 council members, or many of the 29 council members, decide not to be involved, we're still fine. If some of the chairs don't show up for the committees, everything's okay. It's not dependent on any geographic location. It's not dependent on any person, any company. Uh, a lot of things can go wrong with a lot of Hedera, and it's just fine. I think Hedera is a company that could be around for a thousand years. I think they would say a hundred year company, but I mean, you know, there's lots of countries all over the Asian uh, world that have been around a thousand years. I think that's a, a very cool, honorable thing to kind of think toward. And uh, I think Hedera has, uh, been very clear about their vision, has executed well against that. So I think H-E-D-E-R-A is a great company to look at, Hedera. Try to think if there's another company that I really, really like the way that they do business. I mean, I would just say a lot of the different uh, open source companies are intriguing to me. Like I really liked OpenAI when it was open source, before Sam decided to make it a more traditional company. Oh, you know, there's a company called Steeped Coffee. My friend Josh runs. That's a B corporation, which means it's a low profit corporation on purpose. It, they have no waste, so it's a consumable coffee company. The point of Steeped Coffee, S-T-E-P-E-D-C-O-F-F-E-E, -E -E, steepedcoffee.com. The point of Steeped Coffee was to replace Keurigs. If you don't know, Keurigs basically are one of the number one uh, problems when it comes to waste in the world, all those little Keurig pods. So we created coffee in a tea bag. And the tea bag, the coffee, it's all like boutique coffee, and it's inside these containers that you can kind of brand however you want. So we have like a thousand coffee companies that use our technology to distribute their coffee. 
and uh, there's no waste, everything's compostable, and everything about the way the company's set up with the employees and the partners is all kind of, uh, let's all, rising tide, raises all ships, let's all win together. So I really do like B corporations. I think Kickstarter was a cool example of a B corporation. Uh, and the final one I'll tell you is Visa. When Visa started, I thought that was a super cool experience to look as a business person how Visa did it. Uh, Visa understood that if they could provide credit to people, because you have to understand nobody used credit cards. Like our grandparents when they were your age, they never heard of a credit card. Our parents when they were your age probably didn't use a credit card. Credit cards are a pretty new concept and it really is only done well in the developed world. And you know, um, they had this idea, how do we get all the financial institutions in the whole world to work together and not like destroy each other? Like how do we have this idea of Visa? One way for all the financial institutions to lend money and lend credit to people so they can go finance their burrito. <laughs> Which is so weird. People couldn't believe people were financing hamburgers. It's like, what the hell is going on here? People were financing french fries <laughs> and tennis shoes. This is crazy. Uh, but now it's just normal, right? Now we use credit cards for everything and ideally you're able to pay them off. So I think Visa is a really cool model in the past. I think Steeped Coffee is a really cool startup model, and I think Hedera is a great model for like an enterprise approach to uh, a governance model. So governance, let me explain governance. There is the idea of democracy. Democracy is high trust and very slow. We all agree together. And then there's the idea of a dictatorship. A dictatorship is no trust, but very fast. Whatever homeboy says is what happens. So then people talked about Anarchy. Okay, democracy is too slow, and I'm not really actually a voice. Too many people have a voice I've ne never heard. <clears throat> Dictatorship is horrendous. I don't trust her. I don't trust him. I don't want them making decisions for me. Anarchy. I do what I want. You do what you want. Let's leave each other alone. We and then kind of libertarianism kind of came out of that idea of anarchy. So what the other governance model is that's not talked about is a council. And this is a few trusted people that make decisions quickly. And so that would be the idea around Hedera. That was the idea around Visa. Other questions? Go ahead. What's your name? Mark. Hi, Mark. Um, so in this class, we're doing a project where we have to choose a company and, um, and like strategize how we can enter a new market or a new country, uh, enter this business into a new country. So from the from the businesses or startups that you have started up, um, have any of them gone internationally? And if so, what were like some of like the key decisions that you had to make in order to make that um, make that startup like successful in the another country? Um, I mean, with all the cultural um, differences and like the different like laws that are in that country, like what would be like? Do you have any stories? About strategies you'd like to share? That's a great question. I mean, I could, I could basically talk unlimited uh, on that question. So I'm trying to think of how I can like really tangibly answer that question in a way that is helpful to you. Uh, I just came from Singapore and Manila. So let me just focus on just those two countries and tell you the reasons why there are benefits in those two countries. Singapore is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. It is an English speaking country. A lot of weird rules in Singapore. Like, if you bring uh, cannabis gummies, they will kill you. I'm not kidding. They landed the plane, and like, if you have a vape pen, if you have a joint, if you have cannabis gummies, death penalty. We're going to kill you if you come in here. And they might as well have said, if you got that, go in the bathroom, flush it down the toilet right now. <laughs> so, very clean. Everybody obeys the rules. Everybody's kind of in line. So, if you had some sort of like high-end consumer brand product, you wanted to bring, I'm trying to think like what would be an example, uh, you know, any, any major comic book, any major sport brand, any major clothing brand, uh, or you, let's say you want to make a high-end clothing brand, um, any major consume, like consumer product, like an Apple product, you want to bring it, Singapore's a really cool place, right? You know that they have everything lined up, they've kind of optimized for the human experience, right? If you've ever been to Las Vegas, uh, Las Vegas, the, you ever notice the temperature's just right? The decibel and the sound, the music is just right. The brands look better than they've ever looked before, right? Big, tall ceilings, everything's wide. 
right? Whatever you're looking for is there, and it's there in a way that just seems to be the best version of it, right? Whether it's a show or gambling or the food. So like Vegas has optimized for human pleasure. Singapore has optimized for human productivity and for business. So I think Singapore is a really interesting place. And I think that because it's primarily English speaking, you have a big advantage and they have lots of money and, they, and they're kind of free flowing with uh, you know, paying for things they value. The next one I'll say is Manila. Manila is a city of 25 million people. Philippines is 100 million people. Next to Philippines, uh, Vietnam is 100 million people. Indonesia is 250 million people. So that Southeast Asia region is wildly uh, ripe to be successful with bringing products to them. Now, <clears throat> if I could bring any product to the city of Manila, it would be a blockchain product. The reason for that is the average age is 27 years old. Over 90% of the people have internet connectivity. Uh, the majority of them actually have blockchain wallets and they are using cryptocurrency to buy things. Uh, they are using their blockchain uh, wallets to play video games where they actually get paid, you know, pay to play video games and um, they're collecting digital art and selling digital art. So there's like a real opportunity in the country of the Philippines and specifically the city of Manila, we have access to all these people. And like, for instance, I, I'm friends with like, you know, a hundred of the big time TikTokers. So if I need to bring a product to Manila and I'm ready to like hit the ground running, I just engage all my friends that are TikTokers and say, okay, this is what we gotta tell the world about right now. And then they kind of go to war and they tell the world and that's an easy way to get it to spread because everybody's kind of glued to TikTok there. The other thing about Manila or the Philippines as a country is, uh, this could be different, but from what I understand, the number one export in the country are Filipinos. The number one import in the country is US dollars. It's a very, very, uh, there's a lot of corruption and it's very uh, unfair what's happened to the locals. And this has gone on over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And there never seems to be a way that things break out. So if you have any sort of product that would potentially like bring hope and, 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 and infuse something of significance, I think that's a very unique place to bring uh, a product, especially if it's like a blockchain product. It, I see the time, so I'm be respectful of Vivian and what else she has for the class. So if anybody has any final question or questions, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so do you focus more on um, like adapting from your failures or your successes with the business as well? Do I focus more on adapting from my failures or successes? Well, you know, back to the yin yang thing, everything is a failure, everything is a success. So a lot of it has to do with how you're looking at things. So every day in my career is basically a mixed bag of failures and successes. Um, I think certain personalities get more from certain things. There certainly are certain like Myers-Briggs personalities or Enneagram personalities where focusing on your failures is life-giving and motivating, like I'm gonna boom this thing. And the other personality is like, you focus on your failures and you just like start to go inside and you start to feel depressed and you don't think you're good enough. So, and the same is true for um, your victories. So I think, first of all, know thyself. Like, who are you? How do you tick? You know, if you haven't done personality tests, they're basically free. It doesn't hurt to figure out what your personality is and then start to study like, okay, what does this actually mean for me? Um, and, then, and then figure out, okay, what does motivate me? Like, how do I not let the valve of hope out? Because if failure just deflates me and doesn't motivate me, I probably shouldn't focus on failure so much. If victory makes me lazy and makes me not want to actually work hard, or compared to victory makes me like encouraged, and like we can do this, we're unstoppable, <clears throat> you want to kind of figure yourself out and then look at your life through that lens. Because what you want is motivation. What you want is upward mobility. Nothing stays stagnant in life. Everything is always moving. It is either going down or going up. People talk about the fork in the road. The fork in the road is not like this. The fork in the road is always like that, always. It is always difficult to do the rad thing. It is always easy to do the shitty thing, always and forever in your relationships, in your health, in your finances, in your business, in your education. It is always easier 
to be selfish, to be lazy, to keep watching Netflix or whatever, not picking on Netflix. I like Netflix. It is always harder to save your money and to be servants oriented and to volunteer for that charity and to uh, postpone your benefit. Like it's always harder. So in everything in life, you never want to be like, okay, A or B, you want to be like, am I willing to do the hard work to make it happen? Or it, do I just want the easy path? And that's basically across the board. But when it comes to motivation, you want to kind of figure your personality out. Any other pressing questions before I wrap up? Go ahead. Yeah. Are you going to have a brand help into like streaming platform, or is it more so focused on like podcasting? Yeah, so we are a streaming platform. We talk about podcasting because I believe in audio. I believe audio is the easiest thing for a content creator to create in the world. Don't have to worry about how you look, what's behind you, who's around you. Um, I think audio is the most exploited and least compensated art form in the world, uh, whether it's spoken word, music, uh, teaching, uh, all audio. Is, is highly consumed and not compensated. And so that's why we focus on podcasters because 99% of podcasters lose money. And so for us, it's an easy market to serve well. Uh, we can do video, we can use our product for a lot of things. Think of us as Twitch for audio, but we tokenize the content, prove ownership, and help automate the ability to make money. In addition to, we don't make people come to attention live for the content. So it's not like attention live forward slash Ian's Rad Podcast. It's youtube.com forward slash Ian's Rad Podcast. It's socialmediasite.com forward slash Ian's Rad Podcast. And just wherever somebody's already at, that's where they get your content. They don't have to come to us. We don't want anybody to know who Attention Live is. We just want to create the software platform by which people that create content can create content where people are already at and make money from that content. Any other pressing questions before I say my final word? Go ahead. Um, so, Which name? I don't think I met yet. Hi, Tyler. Um, so when you're setting goals for yourself, whether it's for a company or personal, um, what's your method behind that? Like, are you setting goals bigger or kind of step by step? <clears throat> setting goals. I set less goals now than ever. I'd probably be like wildly so much more successful if I set goals again. <laughs> that was such a good time in my life. Uh, I'm like a flag on a flagpole, my friend. Where's the wind blowing? How am I feeling? Um, that's the advantage of a team. So I think I probably have taken the gas pedal off on goal setting in my life because I surround myself with incredible people that they have more of the goal setting personality. So we do set goals as a team of what we want to accomplish and then deadlines for that. Uh, if I was to set goals, I'd say, you know, just following the pretty traditional things of first thing in the morning, looking at your goals, reviewing those things. What do you want to accomplish today, this week, this month, this year, this lifetime? Most of my goals have to do with the impact I make after I'm gone. So most of my big, huge goals are the impact I'm making in the 25th century. If there's nothing else, I'm going to end with one last story before I give the floor back to Vivian. In 1776, Lieutenant Moraga, my ancestor, landed in Monterey. He was the second in command of the Spanish army, okay? Lands in Monterey, California, goes up to the general of the Spanish army, checks in with him. The general says, I'm retiring. I'm going back to Spain to report to the queen. I want you to go up north and make a name for yourself, Jose. So Jose says, so like, you're retiring, I'm retiring, like we're done? And he's like, yeah, you know, 1776, we've established our dominance all throughout Mexico. It was called New Spain at that time. We've established our dominance all throughout California. It was basically Spain at that time. Uh, and do whatever you want, like go up north. So my ancestor, my grandfather times eight, grabbed the priest, 18 men that he trusted, and all the women and children that were part of those men's families. They land at the Presidio, and my ancestor founded the Presidio. So if you've ever been to the Presidio in San Francisco, that my family founded that. Then they were in San Francisco for about a year. 
made friends with the Native Americans. Now, I wasn't there, so obviously the stories I'm going to hear about my own family are going to be pretty good. But Wikipedia seems to back this stuff up. But then again, the winners always write the stories they want to write. So who actually knows what went on? But from what I understand, homeboy, grandpa, was down with the natives and was nice to him. He then goes down through San Mateo. He goes over the 280 area, and he sees what is now San Jose. And my grandfather, ancestor dude, called it Guadalupe de San Jose. And uh, in November 1777, he founded the city of San Jose. So my family has lived here for 10 generations. And I am like just about every ethnicity you can imagine. Right, uh, because if you're in an area like California that constantly gets, you know, dominated by new cultures over and over and over again, and then becomes kind of an epicenter for all sorts of people to come and be a part of this environment, then you know there's going to be lots of mixed heritage in my background. Um, and so the thing I've learned through Moraga is when I was your age. I started speaking at tech conferences in my 20s. And I remember I used to go on stage and be like, let me tell you about the first great entrepreneur of the Silicon Valley, right? My grandpa, and I'd tell these stories about him and our family and what we did and the things we started and all this stuff. And for some reason, I never actually expected to have kids. I never thought I'd have grandkids. I always thought the world was gonna end. I, either because of the environment or because of some spiritual belief I had of like an Armageddon, or I always figured like something bad was going to happen, and I never gave myself permission to impact the world for 250 years, ever. I never, ever, ever even considered that in the 25th century, the greatest impact of my life will be seen hundreds of years from now. I never thought about building a castle like kings and queens and princes and princesses used to think. They, they, for generations, they would build a castle that their great, 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 great grandkids would live in one day. And for some reason, like in my 30s, it clicked for me. And I thought, you know, I'm constantly talking about Lieutenant Moraga because it's a fun story and it's a family story and it's like unique. And who else around here is part of the family that founded San Jose or the Presidio in San Francisco? So it's cool, right? And I thought, why do I give him permission to be so great? Why does Lieutenant Moraga get permission to have such a huge impact 250 years after he died, but I never give myself permission to have that kind of impact? What is it about my psychology that says it's okay for people in the past to have legacy, but I've never allowed myself to focus on legacy as my primary goal? And I think that was a big shift for me. And I started to think through like, Am I living a life that my great, 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 great grandkids would feel honor and respect for? Do I treat people in a way? Do I operate in business and in finance and in relationship? Do I operate internationally as I'm working with different cultures in a way that would allow those generations that are to come to feel like, wow, that's a cool example. We hope to continue that ourselves. Why don't all of you stand for a moment, if you don't mind? Why don't you stand while I finish? Vivian, I'm done now. I'm going to like give you the floor in 30 seconds. Well, there's nothing special about standing, but it just feels like a nice thing to do. Stretch your legs for a moment. You may or may not think that there's anything to somebody declaring goodness over you. If you do, get ready for it, and if you don't, no big deal. So whether you think it's cool that my family's been here for 10 generations, uh, or whether you think it's cool I've started eight companies, or whatever you might think is cool, I just declare grace upon your life, upon your actions, upon what you do. There's been for millennia elders, and I'm like an elder millennial, 42, born in 81. Uh, elders have blessed the next generation, have spoken life over the next generation. So I speak life over you. I say, let you be wise. May you make great decisions. May you be uh, kind and diligent. May you work hard in all that you do. And from a family that's lived on this land for 250 years, I welcome you regardless of how long you've lived here, if your parents or grandparents lived here, if you've just come for school, you are welcome 
you're welcome on this land, if that means anything to you. And for those of you that are running after things as an entrepreneur or running after things in your career, uh, you know, just be faithful. Don't take life too seriously. If you die, if I die, world moves on. I mean, the world moves on when the most important people in the die. So life's not that big of a deal. Everything's pretty chill. Just take, take a big deep breath. It's all good. Relax. Everything will be fine. School's not that important. Don't tell Vivian I said that. It's just school, okay? It's just school. So just take in the joy of life. Get yourself on a one wheel or whatever your one wheel is. You know what I'm saying? Thank you for your attention and for letting me come and be a part of the class today.